Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Grace Community Church Wednesday night service. Uh, again, it's good to see y'all, and if you're watching online, we're glad to have you too. And if this is your first time watching, uh, my name is Wade, and like I said, we are glad to have you. But let me go ahead and pray for us, and we'll get right into tonight's message. Father, I thank you again for this message you've laid on my heart this week. I thank you for this series that we're in, Lord, and uh, Father, I just pray for everybody that's here that you would help us to just set, set aside our cares and our worries of the day, Lord, and the things going on in our life, and uh, help us just be able to give you our full attention right now and uh, hear what it is you have to say. And God, I pray that you'd help us to remember the things that you're saying to us, and Lord, I just pray that you'd give us the courage to apply these things to our lives so that we can be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. But uh, like I said, for the, for the last few weeks, we've been in a, a series <coughs> on the armor of God. And, uh, you know, I always like to say this every week. You know, we started this series based on Ephesians 6.10, which says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Uh, that's what Paul is telling these new believers. And then we go into the armor of God. He's telling them how. Uh, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So Paul, he's explaining to the people that he's writing to that the new life that they're beginning is a spiritual life, and we're going to have to rely on the Lord's strength. Uh, we're going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit instead of relying on our own strength like we always have. So for the last few weeks, that's what we've been doing. We've been going through the armor of God that Paul uh, gave them, <clears throat> been going through them one by one to see what they mean and uh, how do I actually apply that to my life. You know, it's, sometimes it's easy to just read through the Bible and we, we skim over things and because we don't really understand what that means, we just move on and keep reading a different spot. So we've been trying to go through them slowly and explain them so you will know how to apply these things to your life. Uh, you know, so far we've went over the belt of truth, we've went over the breastplate of life, righteousness, and you'll find both of those in uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 14. And last week uh, we went over verse 15, where it says, you know, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And uh, what that was talking about was preparing myself, uh, or preparing yourself, to walk in or live out the gospel in your life as a follower of Jesus. And uh, preparing and learning and making adjustments in my life so that I can effectively share the gospel with others too, not just live it out in my own life, but uh, learn about it and uh, so that I can effectively share the gospel with other people. Uh, but if you missed any of those messages, you can find them online or you can find them on YouTube or you can listen to them on our podcast. But tonight, we'll be talking about Ephesians 6, verse 16. <clears throat> and it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, you know, all through the Bible, it talks about God as being our shield. Uh, we see that a lot. There's tons of verses in the Bible that, you know, say God is our shield. And I've picked two of those just to share with you, uh, Psalm verse three, or Psalm three and verse three, it says, "But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head." Uh, one of my favorite ones, you know, where it talks about God as our shield, is in Proverbs uh, chapter thirty and verse five. It says, "Every word." And the reason I like that one so much is because the word of God is our shield, also. You know, God Himself is our shield, but the word of God is our shield too. It says, every word of God is pure, and he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And we'll be talking a lot tonight about trust. And uh, But that's one of the reasons I like that verse so much. So God is our shield, God's word is our shield, and our faith is in him. And uh, y'all know I like to break the verses down and give you definitions and stuff. But the word faith in verse 16 it means a firm belief in the truth. But more specifically in that definition, it says the truth of the gospel and reliance on Jesus Christ for our salvation. 
That's what that faith is. We have faith in Christ that we will get salvation through him. Uh, it's a belief that he is the Messiah. It also means trust. And uh, I not only believe the gospel, and I not only believe Jesus is the Messiah, I trust him. And uh, because I trust him, I believe in him, and I will obey him. Uh, that's what faith is. It's a, a belief so firm in him that he is who he says he is, that I trust him enough to actually obey him. Uh, so what Paul is actually saying in that verse is above all, by my faith in God, by my belief in Him, by my trust in Him, I know that if I'm obedient to Him, I'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And, uh, you know, I tell you all the time, God's not trying to keep us from having fun. A lot of times we look at God's Word as a bunch of rules to, to take the fun out of life, to keep me from doing things that I want to do. And uh, that's just not the truth. You know, we share this verse with you all the time, too, in Psalm 84 and verse 11. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. He gives us good things, uh, and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You know, there's that word shield again in that verse. But God don't want to keep us from having fun at all. He wants us to keep us from doing things that harm us, uh, things that bring bad consequences in our life. And a lot of times that's the only verse we share when we talk about this, but if we go on and read the next verse, in Psalm 84 and verse 12, it says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in you. <coughs> or you could read it, you know, blessed is the man who has faith in you, uh, the man that is obedient to you. So we have to trust the Lord. Uh, obedience is protection for us. Obedience keeps us from getting burned by those fiery darts. It keeps us from doing things that cause us to get hit by those fiery darts. Uh, you know, last week at the end of the message, I told you that I've always heard that verse 16 preached, you know, at the end of it, the fiery darts of the devil. But that's not what it says. It actually says the fiery darts of the wicked. But, you know, is the devil wicked? Yes. He's very wicked. That's where all wickedness comes from. Uh, but are there some wicked people that throw fiery darts at us too? There's a lot of wicked people that throw uh, fiery darts at us. That's, a lot of times that's how the enemy uses other people to get to us. You know, I don't think anybody in here has ever stood face to face with the devil. But we've seen him a lot of times through what other people do to us. And... You know, we get all those hard consequences from those things. We get burnt. Uh, and that's what Paul's talking about when he's saying fiery darts. What he's saying there is there is a way to live that we can quit getting burnt all the time. You know, anybody ever feel like I just get burnt all the time? Every which direction I go, somebody's burning me. But there's a way we can protect ourselves from that. You know, that word wicked simply means hurtful. Uh, you know, when somebody's doing something to you that's hurtful or harmful, it means to de degenerate, to decay. You know, people are doing things that knock you down, keep you from uh, being up where you want to be. It means painful. Uh, it means toilsome. You know, if you're always arguing with somebody, uh, those are fiery darts. Those are things, anything to harm you, to bring you down, uh, to cause you to have a bad day, to get you to break your character and uh, act in a way that don't reflect, you know, the fruits of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, harmony, anything that's good that comes from God, that's what those fiery darts are, are designed to do. They're designed to keep you and me from being the man or the woman of God that we're supposed to be. Uh, that's what they're for. You know, anything that tears down instead of building up, and, uh, you know, it does mean evil. Like I said, that's where all these things are coming from. It may seem small. Well, it's a small thing. It's, it's not evil. Yeah, if it's not good, if it's not from God, then it is evil. But mostly, uh, I was really surprised when I started studying this. It's not talking about the source of wickedness. It's talking about the effects of wickedness that they have in our lives. And the, 
You know, it's not talking about the devil himself, and it's not talking about people themselves. It's talking about what it does to us. You know, when somebody is shooting us with those fiery darts, it talks about the effects that it has on us and in the way that we live. Uh, you know, does anybody ever wonder why everything's always got to be so hard? You know, we'll do things that we're like, I know this shouldn't be this hard. Uh, you know, that's what those fiery darts are. And part of that definition of wicked or wickedness is hardship. It's part of it is suffering affliction. It means to be injured by wickedness. So when we're under attack by people or the devil or, you know, just the world throwing stuff at us, then that's what we're being injured by wickedness. That's what those fiery darts are talking about. And that that's what our shield of faith is supposed to do. It's supposed to keep us from getting injured by wickedness and having to suffer from the effects of it. Uh, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's what those fiery darts are. That's what we get hit with when we get out from behind our shield of faith. When we step outside of the will of God and uh, back into our own understanding, then we open ourselves up to get hit by those darts. We open ourselves up to get injured by wickedness, you know, when we step outside of obedience. Uh, what stuck out to me the most, and I think everybody in here will understand this pretty good, but what stuck out to me the most when I was studying for this was the comparison. Uh, it said the effects of wickedness have in our lives with work. It says that's exactly what it's like. It's like we're going into bondage. We're going into slavery to what somebody is doing to us and it makes everything hard. It makes everything uh, like we're just having to work really hard. And not like normal work, but like I said, like slave labor, where there's no rest. No matter what we do, we can't get away from it. And it just gets harder and harder and harder. And God didn't intend for us to be slaves. That's why Paul's saying if you'll use your faith the way we're supposed to use our faith, uh, we can live the way that God intended for us to live, in freedom, not in the bondage of the effects of wickedness. And uh, But when we're under the effects of that, you know, it just seems harder and harder, and it seems like we're getting nowhere. Uh, when we get hit by those fiery darts, it says it produces, and this is part of the definition, it produces labor that demands the greatest exertion to complete even the simplest task. And, uh, you know, when we're under the effects of that wickedness and we're just constantly under attack, it does. It seems like it's just super hard to do the simplest little thing because of, because of that. And uh, I know everybody in here has experienced that. I know I have. Uh, Pastor Josh, has, he's been preaching on Sundays about Jonah in the book of Jonah. And uh, he was talking about, you know, their ship was out there in the middle of the sea and God sent that opposing wind. And those sailors just worked harder and harder and rowed and rowed, and they got nowhere. You know, it just kept getting harder. And that's kind of, that's the kind of labor this is talking about. And uh, just like Josh said on Sunday, we got to get off the boat. You know, my efforts, my way isn't working. we got to use our shield of faith. And that shield is a defense piece of armor. You know, it's designed to keep us from getting hit by the enemy. But we got to stay behind it. You know, if God is my shield, and he is our shield, like I said, there's tons of verses that says he is our shield. But if God is my shield and I'm behind him, if something wants to hit me, it has to go through God to get to me. Uh, and there's nothing on this planet or nothing in any realm that can get through God. If I'm behind him and I'm living in obedience to him, the only thing that can get to me is what God allows to get to me. And uh, all through this series, we've been talking about the transition from my old life to my new life. You know, that's what this portion of the Bible is about. Getting rid of the old and bringing in the new. And I think a lot of us are still getting burned uh, by those fiery darts that we've never pulled out. We've never got rid of them. They're still stuck in us from our old life. Uh, you know, we've made the, profession, made the profession, I believe in Jesus, but we haven't changed anything. And if we still got those old darts in us, then we're still feeling the effects of that wickedness. 
when we come to God, our old ways have to die and all things have to become new, you know. We pick up our shield, we profess our faith, but between me and my shield, we still got all this stuff, you know. We're supposed to have our shield with nothing between me and my shield to keep things from hitting me. But if I've got that stuff with me behind my shield, then I'm still feeling the effects of it. I've already been hit by it. And uh, all the things that are attacking me are between me and my shield. And God is my shield. So all those things, if I have not let them go and all things have become new, then all those things are between me and God. You know? And uh, our armor, this armor that Paul is talking about, it's personal. You know, each piece is for me. You know, it's mine. It's my armor. Uh, and your armor is for you. You know, I can't protect myself by changing somebody else. And I think a lot of times that's what we try to do. We have, you know, discomfort or I'm not happy with this in my life. So we try to change other people to get the results that we want. But I can't protect myself by changing somebody else because I can't change anybody else. Uh, that's why Paul is telling me, you, me, I have to put on my armor. Uh, and I put on my armor by changing myself. Uh, last week we talked about preparation. And part of that was adjusting things in order to make ready. And, uh, you know, I can't adjust you, but I can adjust me. Uh, I've got to get the things that are behind my shield out of there. And I've got to get God bet between me and those things. You know, the things that are against me that are causing the effects of wickedness in my life, they can't be between me and my shield. They have to be on the other side of it. And if God is my shield, then there, there can't be anything between me and God. We have to come to Jesus and let him cleanse us and then start a new life. And uh, so many of us, we come and we try to start a new life, but we don't want to start a completely new life. We want to keep this little bit of it, and I don't want to let go of that. And those things are between us and our shield, the thing that would protect us from that. We've got to get those things uh, that are behind our shield out of there. And uh, I've got to get God between me and those things, not the other way around. Uh, but like I keep saying, when we come to God, or in most cases, you know, we're full of fiery darts. And we've got to let, we got to let him pull those things out of us and stay behind our shield so we don't get hit by new ones. Uh, you know, when Paul is telling him about this shield, he's talking about a Roman soldier, you know, when he's describing this armor because they saw him everywhere. You know, they were all over the place where they lived. Probably on every street corner you'd see a Roman soldier, and he's describing the things that they're wearing because they would be familiar with them. Uh, like I said, they're everywhere. And when a soldier was preparing for battle, just like we are, if we're starting a new life in Christ, we're preparing, like we talked about last week, to be followers of Christ. That's a battle in this world. But they would take those shields, and they, you know, most of the time they were made out of wood, and they would soak those in water because they knew when they went to war, the enemy is going to be shooting uh, flaming arrows at them or fiery darts. And when it would hit that wet shield, it would extinguish those arrows it would quench the dart and put it out and it wouldn't catch their shield on fire but we've got to do the same thing we've got to saturate our shields with the word of god <coughs> you know we have to know the truth in order to obey it you know god don't expect us to obey something that we don't know but if we want our shield to be effective then we've got to get it wet just like those soldiers did and that's what paul was telling them you know, the enemy's going to be attacking you. There's no doubt about that. But it's up to me and it's up to you how effective your shield is going to be. We've got to saturate our shields with the Word of God so we'll know the truth and we'll know what to obey. You know, I've been telling you every week since we started this series that in order to do this, we have to change our input. Uh, Romans 12:2. I'll go ahead and read the whole verse, but it says, you know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
So that says we've got to change from being conformed to the world. We're already conformed to the world when we come to Christ, but we've got to flip that, and we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can live in obedience to God. But, uh, you know, I've, I told you this last week, and I'll say it again this week, we can't renew our minds with old input. You know, we're never going to have a new life or live a new life by just changing what we do or where we go. Uh, you know, I've, I remember when I was uh, in the height of my drinking, then I would I was a runner. I would go all over places. I went to Missouri. I went to California, uh, all kinds of different states, and got the same results everywhere I went because I didn't change anything up here. I didn't renew my mind. I just changed my location, changed the people, and got the exact same results everywhere I went. And that's what anybody's going to get. Uh, you know, we have to let God's Word and the Holy Spirit renew our minds so that he can tell me where I need to go and he can tell me what I need to do. You know, if I'm still making my own decisions and doing what's right in my own eyes, then, like I said, it don't matter where I go or what I do, I'm still going to get the same results because I'm still the same person on the inside. I haven't truly surrendered my heart to Jesus. I have not renewed my mind. I still have the same thinking that I had before. And uh, if I still have the same thinking... I'm going to wind up doing the same thing. And it's still, you know, I'm still going to keep getting hit with those same old fiery darts. Uh, no matter where I go, no matter how many people I go through seeking a different result, I'm going to get the same thing over and over and over. So we have to change our input. That's the only way we can renew our minds. First, we have to surrender to Christ and receive the Holy Spirit so we can understand the input, but we have to change our input. Uh, you know, so like I keep telling you, whether we read it, whether we watch it on videos, or whether we listen to it on a podcast, we have to get the Word of God in us. That is just vital. If we're not doing that, we're not going to change because our thinking will not change without doing that. Uh, I actually saw proof of that this week and I want to share that with you some of you already know this because you were there but uh, this week at C or last week at CR Celebrate Restoration Pastor DJ he passed out this list had a bunch of Bible verses on it and he said you know read to them pick one that you like that you can apply to your life that you understand that you can use and uh, write it down on an index card and uh, put it in your pocket this week and it was amazing, you know, last night at CR, how many people came back and they had the cards in their pockets. There's one of them now. <laughs> but it was amazing to see how many people came back this week talking about how much that one verse helped them this week. One verse. And uh, if one verse is going to help you, then how hard would it be to get one verse a week? You know, that, that's not hard. But it really was. It was amazing to see how many people came back and talking about how much that one verse helped them. Uh, I Googled it, and there are 31,102 verses in the Bible. You know, sometimes one verse is all you need, though. But there's 31,102, and if one will help you through a week and make that big a difference, what if you had two of them? You know, what if you had three of them? You know, but like I said, sometimes one verse is all you need. God's Word is powerful, but you've got to know it to be able to get behind it. You can't get behind the shield you don't have. Uh, you know, Scripture is what Jesus used when he was being tempted for 40 days of the devil in the wilderness. You know, he said, if you're the Son of God, turn that stone into bread. And Jesus is like, no, you know, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. But every time the devil would tempt him, then he would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. He fought him with Scripture. And we can do the exact same thing that our Lord and Savior did. All we got to do is get a verse in us and actually use it when the temptation comes or when the fiery dark comes, whatever it is. You know, there's a verse for everything. If you're afraid, then Psalm 56, 3, I think it is, says, you know, what time I'm afraid, I will put my trust in the Lord. 
You know, if you're anxious, there is, you know, verses in Philippians about don't be anxious about nothing, but tell God about it, and he'll give you the peace that passes all understanding, but we've got to get those verses in us. Uh, like I said, our shield can be as big as we want it to be. You know, I tell you all the time when I'm feeling overwhelmed, one of the verses I use the most is Psalm 46.10. I just got to take a break and say, oh, just be still for a second and remember that he's God, not me. Uh, you know, he's, he's big enough for me to get behind because I know he's there, I know he's in control, and I know everything's going to be okay. All I got to do is stop and remember that verse quote it to myself for a second, and then I do. I calm down, I look at the problem, and it's not that big anymore because I'm not facing it alone. I remember I have a God that is there to help me. Uh, another one of my favorite ones is Hebrews 13.5, and I got those on my index card. I've got mine. But uh, Hebrews 13.5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Covetousness, that's a hard word. And be content with such things as you have. You know, I hear people all the time, and I'm guilty myself. We are just experts on complaining. Uh, it don't matter if it's traffic or just little things. We complain all the time. But when I remember that verse, and God says, be content with what you have. Be content with the way the day is going, because I'm with you, and I'm not going to leave you. And when I remember that no matter how bad the day is, no matter what the situation is, Jesus is with me. He's going through it with me, and he's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me. And that helps me to calm down and just accept things the way they are and uh, know this is temporary. I'm going to get through this. You know, I just, sometimes I just need to know that God's there, and he's not going to leave my side, and he's not going to forsake me. But, you know, we need those things in our heart to lead us, to guide us, to keep us from shooting darts at ourselves and to keep us from shooting darts at other people. You know, we like to think about the darts being fired at us, but uh, we do a lot of dart firing ourselves when we're not being led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, another example that I had a brother, this was before Tuesday, this was last Thursday, and he was talking about his verse. You know, he told me... Uh, Last week when we were picking out verses at CR, he said, my verse is not on there. You know, I can't remember the address on it, but he said it goes something like this, you know, be slow to speak, slow to wrath. And that's all he could remember. And uh, he was talking about James 1.19, where it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. But he couldn't remember what verse it was. He couldn't remember uh, where it was in the Bible. He but even though he couldn't quote it or get the address on it, he had it in his heart. And uh, that's what matters. He was living it. He said that one verse, even though he couldn't remember the whole thing, kept him from saying all kinds of things that he shouldn't say. You know, he was using his shield. And that's a small shield. That's not even a whole verse. And it protected him. And it kept him from shooting darts. And it kept him from getting with the ones he would have got back. So we don't need a big shield. We just need a shield. And uh, obedience to one verse is better than quoting the entire Bible and not obeying any of it. Uh, we've got to get that stuff in us. But like I said, James 1.19 was the verse he was talking about. And by doing that and not just knowing what it said, he actually did what it says in James 1.20. It says, For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. By doing verse 19, he wasn't doing verse 20. He wasn't taking his wrath out on somebody else. He wasn't going against God. And he wasn't shooting somebody else with a fiery dart. Scripture works if we use it. But we've got to get it in there to use it. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse 11. It says, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, you know, if we read that in context of what we're talking about, it would say, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not shoot any fiery darts towards anybody else. I won't be causing harm. I won't be causing uh, 
throwing wickedness at people so they'll be suffering from it. And, uh, you know, I had another guy tell me that he was talking about a verse out of Psalm 119 too, but he was talking about verse 105. And that says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He said, I've read that verse all my life, but I never got it. I never understood it. But he said, but I get it now. I let God's word decide what I'm going to say. And I let God's word decide what I'm going to do. And it keeps me out of a whole lot of trouble, (laughs) he said. And, uh, you know, that's his shield. You know, we had examples of shields all week this week. So what is your shield? You know, I've got mine on my index card and I've got them written in my heart. But do you have a verse that you can turn to when life is throwing darts at you? Because that really is our shield. Faith in God, trust in God, belief in God, and then obedience to God. Uh, you know, in Ephesians six sixteen, it's saying that our shield says we'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And uh, like I keep telling you, that does include the devil, and it does include other people. And it includes all the evil things that the world throws at us. But like I keep saying, uh, it also includes ourselves. You know, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, and this is speaking about everybody. It says, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But if we're saturated with the Word of God, uh, you know, we can overcome wicked thoughts. We can quench them before they ever get to our lips. But we've got to have that stuff in us. Before they ever cause, before those thoughts ever get out and uh, cause the damage that the enemy intended them to cause. You know, if we're saturated with the Word of God, then it it would stop a lot of things before they ever happen. You know, like saying words like divorce or I hate you or, you know, I quit or we're done. There's tons of relationships, friendships, marriages, jobs, just you name it. There's a never ending list of things that we could prevent from happening if we just had our shield and kept it saturated. You know, if we've got the word of God in us and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, then we'll be able to do what it says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. We'll be able to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God <clears throat> and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, if we take every thought in obedience to Christ, then there's no darts going to be shot. Uh, we'll do like Barney Fife says and nip it right in the bud. Uh, you know, we'll be able to say, if I've got God's Word in me, then I'll be able to say, that's not right. You know, I'm taking you to Jesus before you can do any damage. Uh, I've told you this before, but one of my favorite verses, I have a lot of favorite verses, but I really like this one uh, with what we're talking about tonight. In Romans 8 and verse 1, It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that that is talking about our salvation. I'm not saying it's not. But if we are in Christ, and, uh, you know, we're no longer under God's wrath. That's what it's talking about. But I also believe that it means that if I'm in Christ, and if I'm walking in the Spirit, and not in the flesh, then there'll be no condemnation coming out of me either. You know, that verse is saying there's no condemnation for you if you're in Jesus. But if I'm in Jesus, and I'm walking after the Spirit, not the flesh, then there shouldn't be any condemnation coming out of me either. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't bring condemnation. He brings life. He lifts people up. He restores people. He loves people. He don't judge people and hate people. And if I'm doing those things, then I can know without a doubt that I've let down my shield because those things do not come from God. And I'm being bombarded by fiery darts of the enemy, and I'm shooting them at other people. So that should be a red flag if we're doing those things that I need to get my shield back up. Uh, But like I keep saying, 
You know, my shield's only going to be effective if my faith is genuine. And my faith is only going to be genuine if I'm being led by the right input. And that is God's Word and Him being Lord of my life instead of me. Uh, let Him make my decisions and not myself. Uh, so like I said earlier, you know, if you've got things behind your shield, things between you and God, you got to get those things out of the way. Uh, if you're still watching movies, we got to change our input. I mean, if you're still watching movies that are full of cussing and nudity, your heart is absorbing all that stuff. You might not think it is, but it is. Your heart is absorbing that stuff like a sponge. And, uh, you know, if you're still engaging in conversations that you shouldn't be a part of, you know, dirty jokes at work or wherever, uh, it don't have to be at work anywhere. If you're still engaging in that stuff that you shouldn't be a part of, your heart is absorbing that stuff. And our heart don't need any help on being wicked. You know, we're born with a sin nature. And when we come to Christ, that's what we're trying to get rid of. But if we keep feeding it, it's never going to die. It's never going to It's never going to change. You know, if you're gossiping and tearing other people down and doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing, you know, that's a never-ending list. You could fill in the blanks on that. But our heart is absorbing all that stuff. And uh, even when you think it's not, and that works with Scripture too, just sitting and reading, your heart is absorbing that stuff. And whatever we're absorbing more of, that's what's going to come out of us. Uh, that's what Jesus himself says in Matthew 12 and verse 34. He says, O ye generation of vipers, how can you, be e being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, what is the abundance in your heart? Does it have more of the world in it, more of my sin nature in it, or is it filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible says to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it will flow out of us. But if it's not in us, it can't flow out of us. We have to change our input. You know, when we, when we watch those things and engage in those things and do those things that we know are not okay with God, then we're tearing our own shield apart. And when we start getting hit with those darts, it's not God's fault. It's not that we have a faulty shield. Uh, like I keep telling you, it's our responsibility uh, how effective our shield is. And when we're doing those things, we're shooting darts at ourselves. You know, we choose how effective our shield's going to be. I heard somebody say once, and I, I can't remember who said it, but they said, you can have as much of God as you want. But how much of God do you want? Uh, you know, Jesus put it this way in John when he was talking to the guy by the pool. In John chapter 5 and verse 6, he said, When Jesus saw him lie and knew he had been in that case a long time, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? And Jesus is telling us the same thing. You've been like this all your life. You've been suffering from the effects of wickedness all your life. Do you really want to be made whole? Uh, if we do, then we have to choose it. You know, he goes on and tells the guy in verse 8, you got to rise up, take your bed, and walk. You can't stay there. you got to get up. you got to change some things. you got to make the adjustments we were talking about last week and, uh, you know, change our input so we're, and get the Word in us so we'll have a shield. Uh, you know, I tell you every week that this whole series it starts in Ephesians 4, but we've got to put off the old man and be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And I want to share these verses again with you this week in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. We've got to put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. You know, we've got to put that stuff off. It's corrupt and you know, we're trying to get rid of the corruption. We're trying to lead holy lives now. And we've got to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And that we've got to put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's what we've been talking about every week. You know, we go over a piece of armor. These are the things we have to put on. Uh, but if we don't change our input, and if we don't get the word of God in us, then we can't even use the armor because we don't have it on. 
You know, knowing the truth and obeying the truth, that is our shield. You know, life is still hard. Offenses are still going to come, but we're not making our own lives harder, and we're no longer a slave to the bondage of the consequences of sin when we're walking in obedience to the Lord. You know, life gets a whole lot easier when I'm not causing problems for myself. And, uh, and when we do that, we don't have to walk in constant dread of the harvest. You know, we do plant what we sow, but if we know that we're planting the things that the Lord wants us to plant, things that please the Lord, then we can look forward to good things coming instead of walking around, you know, bracing ourselves for the next bad thing to happen. And I, I think a lot of us, including myself, you know, when I first came to Christ, I just kept waiting for the next bad thing to happen because I was so used to it. I didn't know what blessings were, you know, because that's all I did was fill myself with the wrong input. I didn't have a shield. I was just constantly getting hit from every side. And I know what that's like. But when you do get, develop your shield and use it, life gets better. And uh, you start having hope for your future. You have joy in today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to be happy. You know, we can have those things if we're safe behind our shield. Uh, if we're doing like... I share this work, uh, verse about every week too. Ephesians 5 and verse 10 in the NLT says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. If we will just do that one verse, maybe that can be your shield this week. Uh, I heard testimony of people using one verse all week last week and it made a huge difference. This one will definitely make a huge difference if we carefully determine is this going to please the Lord or not? And then make our choice to please the Lord. Let that be your shield this week. Uh, like I said, next week I won't be here. I'll be in West Virginia visiting my my daughter and my granddaughter and the, the rest of them up there, my son-in-law and uh, a few other people. But when I get back, we'll wrap up this series in verse 17, which says, <clears throat> you know, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing that, but that'll be uh, two weeks from tonight. I think it's the 15th of May. But that'll be our verse for the next message. So, you know, how is your shield? Is it full of holes or does it have things behind it that don't belong there? You know, Paul's always telling us we need to examine ourselves. Uh, and like I keep telling you, our shield's going to be as big and as effective as we want it to be. Now we know it's our faith in God, it's obedience to God, and it's God's Word. If I get God's Word in me, it will protect me if I'm obedient to it. But uh, like I always say, only you and the Lord know the answer to that. You know, I know He's Lord of my life, but I can't judge whether or not He's the Lord of yours. Only you know that. Uh, but I like to do this at the end of every message and I hope I always get the opportunity to do that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and if you know that your relationship with him is not where it needs to be uh, you know it's really simple all you got to do is cry out to God and tell him God I need you in my life I want to surrender my life to you I want to live for you and you come to him just as you are and he'll accept you just as you are but it's that simple all you got to do is cry out and say god i need you and he'll be right there uh, romans 10 verses 9 and 10 it says if you shall confess with your mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in your heart that god has raised him from the dead you shall be saved for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation uh, so cry out to God. Just say, Lord, I need you, and he will meet you right there. And if today is the day you've done that, then tell somebody. The Bible says with confession is made unto salvation. You know, first tell Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. You're confessing to him. And then tell somebody else, I gave my life to Jesus today. And if you've done those things, the Bible says you are saved. And uh, being saved is not a feeling. I mean, it does feel great when you get saved. But, you know, I've heard people say, I did that, and I don't feel any different. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. And uh, once Jesus is Lord of your life, start learning about him, and then start being obedient to what you learn. 
And I, I guarantee you, your life will start changing right then. But don't ever think you've been too far gone, uh, been too bad, that God don't want you no more. Romans 10 and verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no requirements other than calling on the Lord. You can't be good enough. You can't earn it. Uh, all you have to do is cry out and say, God, I need you. And he will meet you right there. Uh, the whole reason he came, Romans 5, 8 says, is because we're sinners. You know, ever since Adam and Eve, we're all born with a sin nature. And Jesus is the only antidote. He is the only way to eternal life. But it says but God showed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, it don't matter if you're living in sin right now. God still hears you. If you cry out to him, uh, he heard Jonah in the middle of a whale in disobedience. Jonah was literally in sin, and God heard him. So it don't matter what you're doing. Cry out to God, and he'll meet you right there. And uh, I hope you do that today. But I hope this really helps somebody understand what your shield actually is and uh, how to apply it to your life. If you don't have a verse... Uh, find one. Uh, if you want that list I was talking about that we use at Celebrate Restoration, let me know and I'll get you one. And then you can pick your own verse. But that that really does work if you use it. But that's my message for tonight. And uh, like I said, I'll be in West Virginia next week, but I'll be back the week after that. But uh, let me pray for us and we will be dismissed. Father, I just thank you again for this message. And Lord, I just pray to you to help each of us, Father, to, to examine our own lives and see if there's anything uh, between us and our shield, between us and you, God. And if there is anything that's hindering that relationship, Lord, and keeping us from the protection that you offer us, anything that's keeping us from being able to use our shield effectively, Lord, and, and escape the effects of that wickedness, I pray that you'd show us what it is. And God, I pray that you give us the courage to bring it to you and confess it and let you take it away from us, Lord, and, and cleanse us from it so that we can go out and be your hands and feet, Lord, and, and tell others about you and be the men and women of God that we're supposed to be. Lord, we thank you for loving us first, and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.